Well, I just love when they're here. I know I always say that, but that's because they're not here enough. <laughs> we only get them like two or three times a year. Our next time is in November, which seems so far away. Um, but I always love what they share and how they share it and the fact that they both have such compassion for God's children. So I'm excited for tonight's message. Would you please welcome Annette Eckhart from Bridge for Peace. Oh, I didn't share the testimony because I think everybody has been here before. No, we have any people that are new, visiting, never? We do? Who's visiting first time, never been here? Anyone? Yeah, we've all been here. They're new, they're new. Oh, you're so cute. <laughs> you're so sweet. Please welcome Annette. Yeah. Slight, slight change in plans, but uh, uh, we're so delighted to be back again. There's a dozen of us, we're, and we're so blessed to be here with you. Um, it's God's gift. So in, in the beginning of the year, uh, we, uh, in combination with uh, Annette's book, Spiritual Secrets About Suicide, uh, we created a, a video um, with the, the team that was here in November. Uh, they, uh, Australians were here, Africans were here, all Bridge for Peace celebrating our 30th anniversary here in the States. So that was fantastic. We were really excited about that. And uh, the Lord just put on our hearts to uh, you know, pray against uh, suicide because it is such an epidemic. And uh, we came together and we... We learned about uh, different things about suicide and different things, ways that uh, uh, the devil is attacking us. So uh, we responded with a video. You know, we're also coming against that that uh, show, Thirteen Reasons to Essentially Commit Suicide. Well, this is thirteen plus reasons to live in hope, and we're going to run a brief video. A reason to live in hope is, as perceptions change, life evolves. A reason to live in hope is, God will support you as you grow into your life's purpose. A reason to live in hope is to give life to your dreams. A reason to live in hope is, your life will make a bigger impact than your death. A reason to live in hope is, there is power in forgiveness. A reason to live in hope is your life absolutely changes the course of the world. A reason to live in hope is there is beauty in the world just waiting for you to discover it. A reason to live in hope is that problems are not permanent. A reason to live in hope is the good details of your future will unfold. A reason to live in hope is because sexuality is a precious gift to you. A reason to live in hope is that you're more than your guilt and shame. To live in hope is creativity brings resolution. A reason to live in hope is there is always a doorway of hope in your valley of trouble. A reason to live in hope is when you can choose life, you can speak a more powerful message. A reason to live in hope is that people want to connect with you. A reason to live in hope is to give voice to your truth. A reason to live in hope is because you are lovable. Great. I probably just have my Bible there. Praise Jesus. We love to come here. We're so blessed. And I'm so excited tonight because I didn't know we're like the last ministry coming through before the break. So it, praise Jesus, we're going to leave an anointing here for everybody that's going to be doing deep cleaning. Thank you, Lord God. Let the deep cleaning begin in Jesus' name. <laughs> praise you, Lord. So, you know, I'm, I'm going to go a little bit of a different direction tonight. Usually, Bridge for Peace, we're talking about Jesus Christ, our Bridge for Peace and miracles, signs, and wonders mostly in physical healings, healings from addiction, healings even Saturday was great, just talking about the healings we've seen from mental illness, 
people with psychotic splits that have come back, different things that we've seen, because we need, as a body of Christ, to start to believe for that. I don't think that as believers we really have um, seen a lot of people with faith for that, but we have seen it happen. We're, we're giving witness to that, and I want to really raise your faith in that direction. But today, you know, there's other things that God gives to us, which we know, and I want to talk a little bit about some of the other things. I want to talk tonight about God's stories. And I want to share stories going around uh, Matthew 10. If you want to turn to Matthew 10, if you're there, to seven, chap, chapter 10, verse 7. As you go, getting a lot of something in here. I'm breathing heavy or something. I don't know what it is, but... Jean, Jean, help me, Jean. <laughs> Thank you. But uh, 10, as you go, and as you know, Bridge for Peace is a going ministry. It's a um, short-term mission teams. So we have those that stay and pray all across the world, those that go into the field, and those that send us financially. As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Oh, thank you, Jesus. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick. So you always hear us say in Bridge for Peace, does it say pray for the sick? It says, heal the sick. Cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, drive out demons, for freely you have received, freely give. And we have received so much in Bridge for Peace freely because of Jesus Christ. And, you know, always talking about the miraculous healings. We're always giving him glory for that. And, but I want to talk a little bit more tonight about some of the other things that could encourage you that we see because Jesus has freely given and because we have opened our hearts to freely receive. I want to talk about just recently in Entebbe because we're just back from Uganda. People are saying, where, where have you been when we came in tonight? Many people ask me, where have you been? We're just back from Uganda and while we were in Entebbe, we land in Entebbe, and then we travel about six to eight hours, depending, to Kasesi, where we work. This time in Entebbe, it was freezing cold in Africa. It was a lot of heavy rain, and the temperatures were low for Africa. They were in the 60s, but it was really cold. I was really feeling chilled. I mean, you know, Jesus says, don't bring a lot of stuff with you, right? So I don't bring a lot of stuff. So I wasn't bringing any jacket because I wasn't going to need a jacket there. Well, I was praying when in our, the place where we stay, there's a, a hallway and there's different little shops there. And they know me when I come in. They're always, I always go in and greet them. I'm always praying for people in the shops. And this time there was a lady there who had a surgery and it hadn't gone right in her leg. So she had two years of pain from this surgery that had gone wrong and actually went in the shop. She had her foot up on a chair and her friend told me the story. I said, well, would you like me to pray for you? And I prayed for her and through the power of Jesus Christ, she was totally miraculously healed in that moment. Praise Jesus. And th then her friend came and said, you know, I have sciatica pain. I always struggle with that. So I prayed for her and through the power of Jesus Christ, she was totally miraculously healed from the sciatica pain. And then what happened is every time I went by, they had more people in the shop just waiting for me to pass by that they're pulling me in that I could pray for these people. And praise God for that. It was, it was beautiful. And then they said to me, they reached up. It was a little shop with all kinds of clothes. She reached up and she took this hanger down. And on the hanger, there was a little jacket. She says, this is what, I want you to have this. I want you to have this from us. Who knew there was a hooded jacket somewhere in Uganda? Yeah. And that's what I was got, the hooded jacket, because freely he has given for us. Praise Jesus. And that's what I really want to encourage you tonight with whatever it is that you need, whatever it is that you feel you're lacking. Whatever you think, you know, I got there, I didn't pack it. The closet was a long way away, but Jesus provided it. So that's what I want to encourage you tonight, to know that there's many ways that God's going to provide for you that you didn't imagine that you didn't think you had it, but it's up in your storehouse in heaven, and God would just release it in the right moment. I want to talk about when we were going to China for the first time. Kev, you want to give a wave? So Kev was with us and Ed, and it was not a Bridge for Peace mission, but we were asked to join another mission. 
So Kevin and Ed and myself, we traveled together. And we had a, um, we we're going to meet our rest of our team on the mainland. So we had a travel agent arrange everything for us. And praise be to God, it was very affordable. God's always good to us that way. So we were staying at the Great Eagle Hotel. Well, when we walked into the Great Eagle Hotel, they had a bouquet in the center hall the size of me, flower arrangement. It was a gorgeous, gorgeous hotel. So they had a pool on the roof. So we said, well, let's go, you know, let's go, let's swim, let's enjoy. So we were also thinking about where are we going to eat? And I said, well, let's ask the guy who's cleaning the pool because we're certainly not going to ask the concierge because that's not the kind of place we want to go to. He's, he's going to send us to a very expensive place. The boy who cleans the pool knows where we want to eat. <laughs> so we had a great time up on the roof, and then the guys went to change, and I went into the ladies' locker room, and it was all teak wood with beautiful vistas of Hong Kong, and it was just, like, amazing. So I go to meet the guys that come out, and they're not there. So I'm thinking, What's where are they? And I'm waiting and waiting and waiting. They're not there. I go back into the ladies' locker room, which has a telephone in it, and I telephone the room. And they're in the room, and they're laughing. I said, I'll be right there. So what happened was they went to get the keys for the locker room, for the men's locker room, and they looked them up, and they said, you're not paying enough money to use the locker room. And then... Ed's, Ed was joking, saying, you made me lose face before my brother-in-law. So we were paying such a low rate at this hotel that they wouldn't even allow us to use the locker room. Can you imagine the favor of God to pay like such a low rate to get into this like beautiful hotel? So we went um, onto the mainland, and one of the things that we did is we met the, a governor. We were going to different places in China, and the governor of one of the regions came to meet us when we got off of the plane. And he took us to some place we ate under a tent, I don't even remember, with all the different officials. We were blessed to be able to pray with so many officials in China and to travel with them and to even get invited. They even came into our hotel room and they loved it. We were singing Amazing Grace and all these songs. They had no idea what we were singing, but they loved it and they loved us. So they invited us to their own special place where tourists don't go, where only the Chinese people go. And we got to see chicken feet on a stick and little worms and cocoons and things that they eat and all kinds of different things that you wouldn't see in the tourist section. And also they were serving all this beer, homemade beer. And we were sitting along the Mekong River, which I thought was very significant. I thought as we're there and we're praying really for all the things that we, you know, we're, we're aware of that happened in that area. And they would pour us the beer and they would cheat, toast. I can't believe I forgot the toast because they toasted so many times. And we would toast and it was very dark. We're at the edge of the river. We would toast and toss it over our shoulders. And then, you know, they would pour it again. We would toast and toss it over because we weren't going to drink any of that. But at the governor's dinner, they had a bottle of wine, and they, it was somehow tied up with the missionaries. I don't know if the missionaries had something on the label about the missionaries. So Kevin wanted to bring a bottle home to his wife, Karen. So we went into a sh this little shop, and in the little shop, uh, we were asking for that wine, trying to figure it out. And at the same time, there was a gentleman in there that said hello to us. We were saying hello in Chinese, which we know made them laugh. He said hello in English, which was pretty funny, too. And then uh, he asked if he could walk with us. So we said, sure, come on, walk. And he was in there to buy water. So as we came out, we saw these, this kiosk full of candles that were lotus, lotus candles all on the kiosk. We hadn't seen that in the daytime. So we asked him, what... What do they do with those? What is that? And he said, I want to tell you about it. He says, we take these candles, we light them, and we release them in the river. We wish on them, and we release them in the river. So we said, let's do it. Let's go. So he's like, okay. So we took us through all these back winding streets till we got to the river. And then he says, okay, now you make a wish. We said, well, we're Christians, so we don't wish. We pray. And he says, you pray! 
and we turn around to pray, and we've got all these Chinese people that followed the white people all through the streets and all. They're all at the side of the river. And we just prayed the blessings of God on the Chinese people and the rivers of life to flow like this river was flowing, the rivers of revival in China, rivers of healing and grace to flow through China. You know, and it was just, a, we, it was an amazing moment for all of us. And then we walked alongside the river to follow the lotus candle. And as we walked, the way we do things in Bridge for Peace is we submit to each other. So Kevin struck up like a relationship with this young man. His name was David. And Kevin started to walk with David. And Ann and I walked behind. And we're praying as Kevin's walking with David. We're praying for what's happening there. So we're never competing. We're never trying to jump in. Well, let me minister to this one or some of those things you see. But we're submitting to each other. So Kevin's walking with him. And we hear Kevin say, there's, there's a, um, a David in the Bible. His name was David. Saying, there's a David in the Bible, King David. And they start talking. It ends up that David, who we met, had part of a Bible and that he was a Christian. So the next day, the three of us come out of the hotel, and we thought, why don't we get some fruit? Why don't we get something? So we decided, well, we want to walk through the town. We had different things. So the way we do things, we come together, and we decide as a team, which direction should we go? What should we do next? So we decided we should get the fruit first and walk into the town later. Well, it, God was in it the whole time. We didn't know, but God was in it the whole time. As we walk into the town, Kevin takes a turn. Ed and I are going in another direction. And who do we meet again the next day in China, a country with many people? We meet David. So we start to walk with David, and he's a Christian. And I say to him, David, have you received the Holy Spirit? And he says, Holy Spirit, what's, what's Holy Spirit? So he pulls out his pocket translator and he types it in and he reads it and he says, oh, now I understand. But I thought, well, I don't know what it said because I can't read Chinese. So we, we stop underneath a tree and we tell him the Holy Spirit is the one that brings the empowerment from Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit is what opens our minds to Jesus, opens our understanding to Jesus and to his word. And I start to talk to him about how much the apostles needed the power of the Holy Spirit, that Jesus said, don't do anything but wait in the upper room. Jesus said, you're not equipped. Wait in the upper room until the Holy Spirit comes to you. And then once the Holy Spirit came, they were totally transformed. They became bold. They became able to preach what they weren't able to preach before. There was total transformation through the power of the Holy Spirit, the overcoming power that we need in our lives also. So I said, David, do you understand? He said, yes. He says, I want that. I said, then let's pray. So when I prayed for him underneath the tree, and then as we walked down the street, David says, everything is new. The greens look greener. The sky looks bluer. Everything's brighter. Everything looks new. Yes, praise the Lord. So we knew that he'd had the, pa the baptism of the Holy Spirit, he received the Holy Spirit. But then I started to worry, I started to think, well, maybe he thinks, you know, because of the way it is in these nations, well, there's the God the Father, and there's God the Son, and there's God the Holy Spirit, and there's the God of death, and there's the God of this, and there's the God, I got worried that he's gonna think, you know, that there's so many gods. So it just so happened we had a banana because we went to buy the fruit first. And I remembered from a mission that we'd had in Kenya in 96, one of the people on the team showing me this. So I said, David, it's like this. And I peeled the banana. And I said, it's one God. Now see, it's too soft, Ed, in three persons. Well, you see it peels. If this wasn't as soft, it would peel into a third. Three pieces. It peels into three. Thank God, I didn't even know that banana was perfect that day because it peeled into three. So I said, it's one God in three persons. And David said, I understand. He had to understand because you see the banana. <laughs> and with that, he said, oh, I have to run to work. And that's what happened. He ran off to work. We became correspondents with David. He would write to us, and we know it's very dangerous in China. It's dangerous to the computers. We used to have to wipe our computers, what we had written and whatever. 
And so at one time he would write and say he wanted to talk about, um, you know, something in Galatians. And we would write and say, you know, is this, is this safe for you? You know, is it safe for you to do this? And he would say, we must discuss the papers of Paul, he would say. <laughs> Praise Jesus. So in coming back home, Kevin left ahead of us and Ed and I went back to that same hotel. And the gentleman, the same gentleman was at the desk. It was a very large hotel. I mean, hundreds of rooms. And now we're coming back two weeks, whatever, after two and a half weeks. And the gentleman's like, oh, yes, I remember you. And he starts typing, looking for a room for us. So you can imagine, we're thinking what room he's going to find. And all of a sudden, he starts talking to the air. He says, oh, yes, why shouldn't I give them a better room? And he gives us this gorgeous room overlooking Hong Kong Harbor for the night because freely Jesus has given. So that Jesus starts to speak to people on your behalf. Jesus is speaking to people right now, people that you've been praying for, people that you're expecting to change. I want to take that I want to take that phrase, they'll never change, and put it through the blood of Jesus tonight. If, if, if we've said that about anyone, or we're thinking that about anyone, let's repent right now in the name of Jesus. Let's just repent that we've said that because we put a curse on them. We said they'll never change. We're, we're cursing them. So let's repent right now of that and say thank you, Lord God, that you're speaking to those that we've been praying for. You're speaking to those that are in need tonight. You're speaking to bring light and life and peace and renewal, new life tonight. So we, we just thank the Lord. We thank the Lord for forgiving us, and we thank the Lord for moving on them. So I want to share with, uh, about Greece. Is Jean, is that where your mom's from? Is she from Greece or Cyprus? Cyprus, okay. Well, the Cyprus story, I'll just tell a bit of the Cyprus story. Very short bit. We were going, we were in Europe, we were coming from Malta, we were stopping in a major city, and I had noticed this woman, and I said to the Lord, I said to Ed, like, the Lord is all, all over that woman. She ended up being the only woman in that same city who was stopping and going to that major city in Italy. Everybody else was moving on. We were getting our luggage off the luggage carousel, and that woman turned to me and said, come to Cyprus. Why don't you come to Cyprus? She says, we have born-again Christians there. Just like that. Wow. And we didn't know each other. That that's what, she gives me her card. She actually was a dentist. <laughs> so about six years later, Ed and I were praying, and we said, did we miss it? Did we miss Cyprus? Did, we got like really... So anyway, we planned to go to Cyprus, so we called her up, and she met us and took us all over, and we ministered to people all over Cyprus. That's how we got there. I say that to you to, just to encourage you, because you don't know where you're going. I mean, I certainly never knew we were going to Cyprus. But when somebody speaks to you and says, come to Cyprus, do you hear the voice of God? That was our question. Did God invite us? Was God calling us? Did we miss something God wanted us to do? And then just starting stepping out. Who knows she's going to know us six years later? But we're going. And that brings me to Greece, how we got to Greece. So we were sensing that we had a call to Greece, that the Lord was calling us to minister in Greece. We didn't know anyone in Greece. And what happened is we go every year, as you know, to, for the Rome prayer walk in Italy. So that year, the return ticket was very expensive. I mean, I know what we should be paying in the different places we go. The return ticket was so expensive. I just kept going to the next day and going to the next day and going to the next day until that ticket came down. It was about twice the price of what it should have been. I think the reason it was like that was the, uh, it, the Olympics were in Italy that year. So I think that was what it was about. So we were thinking, well, this would be the perfect time to go to Greece because we looked up the price to Greece. It was two fifty dollars a person round trip from Greece back to Rome. We were going to have to pay the hotel anyway, the same we would pay it if we stayed in Italy. So the only difference was the airfare, two fifty, five hundred dollars $500 for the two of us. So a lady came to me and said, Annette, I want to give you this. You use it any way you want but I would like you to use it for Italy 
I opened it up, and Samantha can tell us it was $500 there. <laughs> so I said to her, you know, we really feel that we're supposed to go to Greece. This is what we would need to do the round trip. Other than that, it's all the same. And she said, well, then use it. So, okay, so we book Greece. We're going to Greece. We don't know anybody in Greece. We get to Rome. So we're going to be in Rome, and then we'll go to Greece after. We get to Rome, and we get a phone call the day we arrive. And it's from a priest who got a Bridge for Peace brochure from somebody on a bus. And he said, and I looked up and I found out when you were going to be here. And when I get a brochure of somebody I'm interested in, I want to make sure I get right there, right in, in the beginning and see them. So I want to come over to see you tonight. We said, okay. He said, I'll be there about 11 o'clock at night because I'm on a train from Milan on my way. So he said, all right. <laughs> so... So he comes in, and he's Sri Lankan. He's from Sri Lanka. And he, starts, he sits down, and he starts to speak to us. I'm saying prophesying. He's prophesying to us. He's coming to be able to share in the prayers. that We would pray for him for the Rome prayer walk, but God's using him for us. I said, could you just wait a minute, please? I have to go into the bedroom and get my journal so I could start copying down what he's seeing as the future of Bridge for Peace. God's just speaking. And then he says, how long will you be here, et cetera, et cetera. And we said, well, after here, we're going to Greece. Greece! I go to Greece every year. Who's your contact in Greece? Well, we don't have a contact. You've got a contact now. Here's the number. Call her up and tell her you're coming. What plane are you going in on? Tell her she'll meet you at the airport, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's what we did. We called her up. I'll meet you at the airport. I'll be there. I'll arrange the places for you because we, we didn't know anything. And what ended up, what happened, what hen- happened in Greece was we ended up ministering to people from Sri Lanka because the, the neighborhood, we were in Athens, and I guess people that are wealthy in Athens, they have people from Sri Lanka living in their home that get up in the morning, prepare their breakfast, do everything that needs to be done, goes to the, go to their business and work in the business, go to the school at noontime and pick up the kids and make their lunch and all, take the kids back, go back to the business and work in the business till six, come home, and then they prepare the the supper, they do the wash, they do the cleaning of the house, they do everything, and then they start again the next morning. They get a half a day off every other week. So you can call that what you want to call it. Those are the people that we were called to minister to in Greece, and we ministered, I will never forget, ministering to one young man, and you know, the Sri Lankan, the eyelashes are so thick and black and beautiful, and this young man, the tears just hung on the edges of his eyelashes, just quivering like the tears, and they'd run on his face, because he never knew Jesus. And God had sent us from America, through the providence of people, to go to Greece where we didn't know anybody, we didn't know what we were doing there, we we didn't arrange any place to stay, we didn't arrange anything. But God knew why he was sending us there and who he was sending us to. And we just continued to go and minister, even where Paul spoke and spoke to the people who had the, the monument to the unknown God, we spoke up there to someone and shared with them Jesus Christ at that same spot where Paul stood. I mean, we praised Jesus. We had no idea when we said yes. No idea. My friends, say yes. Say yes. You know, Americans, we want everything planned out. We want everything done. We want everything, you know, lined up. It doesn't work that way in the kingdom of God. It works in the kingdom of God, when we rely on him, when we depend on him, when we know what he's spoken to us and we say yes, and then we see the wonderful things happen. Coming home from that, we had like one night before we caught the airplane and we forgot to ask this lady who was arranging everything for us, we forgot to ask her to get a place for us for, the, um, for going home. We had the one night and Ed found a place called the Electra Palace. Now, in Greece, in this, in this time of year, which it was like February, unfortunately, but all the tour books will tell you that a lot of the hotels are used for pros- prostitution because it's low tourist season, so they welcome that in the interim. So I'm thinking the Electra Palace. And I can see pink feathers, you know, and mirror balls and all this, 
Well, we go in and Ed's got our coupon for whatever it was we're paying Ed, what, $50 or something. And he goes in and he shows the coupon. And the man at the desk says, this is impossible. You can't be staying here. Well, when you walk in, everything's marble floors, beautiful columns. It was just the most gorgeous place. He says, you can't be staying here, not at this price. You've got the wrong hotel. Well, all the time we were in Greece, everybody has the things they like, you know, they like to see. Ed always wanted to see Kojak when we were in Greece. So they call the big boss who manages this whole thing, and who does he look like? Kojak. <laughs> so now Kojak is there. So you know when Kojak looks at your hotel voucher and doesn't like the price, you can imagine the face you're going to get, and you're not getting into that hotel. Well, this is what happens. He looks at it and he says, you can't be staying here for this price. This is a mistake. And then he says, how long are you staying? It says one night, he says, why shouldn't I give them a suite? <laughs> Just like that. And we got into this suite. Now I'm thinking you could do anything for one night. We go into the suite with a dining room table and a kitchen. And I look at the bathtub and I think if I push all these buttons on this jacuzzi, I'll be flying to New York from the bathtub. I won't even need a plane. I mean, luxury, luxury, luxury. God did it. God did it. Praise God. I'm encouraging you tonight. I want to encourage you tonight. That's what I'm doing. I'm encouraging you tonight. Because wherever God plants me, I'm contented. Because I said, this is what God has given me. And I will not complain against the living God. Wherever I end up, I praise the Lord. And that's what I just want to share with you. He's good. I just One other thing on accommodations is we were going to be staying in England. And this couple that we were ministering in England, she said to me, um, we're just, we're expanding our business, which I didn't know what their business was, but she said, we're expanding our business into the butcher shop next door. So there'll be a place for you to stay. <laughs> so I'm picturing we're staying on a white cot in the meat locker with the hook <laughs> hanging there and the blood still on the walls. But it's like, praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Wherever it is, praise you, Jesus. Ended up there expanding their bed and breakfast. And when Ed and I were there, there was no one staying, and they took us through one beautiful room to the next and says, you, you choose whichever room you want to stay in. Praise Jesus. Praise Jesus. But if it was a meat locker, I'd praise him just the same. You know, I mean, I appreciated the cabbage roses on the wallpaper. But, you know, it's like, it, it doesn't determine whether I'm saying yes or I'm saying no by the grade of accommodations that, that God gives to me. And that's what I just want to encourage you, just to trust him, to trust him. I'm going to talk about one more, one more, and that's the Philippine Islands. So when Ed and I were in the Philippine Islands, we were, again, it was not a Bridge for Peace mission. It was a Philippine pastor, and every time Ed and I would go to Australia, he would call me. He was calling me up saying, Annette, you're going to Australia. Couldn't you just jump over to the Philippines? Yes, you know, about $1,600 later and whatever airfare, you know, whatever time in the air, et cetera, et cetera. And I would say, no, Pasta, we can't just jump over to the Philippines next year. Phone rings. Annette, can't you just jump over to the Philippines? I'm like, no, Pasta, we can't do that. The next year, again, and finally it was, hello. It wasn't the pastor inviting us. It was God. Yes, it took me three years to figure it out. <laughs> so then Ed and I said, yes, we will come to the Philippines. So when we went to the Philippines, it was not a Bridge for Peace mission again. We were going with the other pastor and his group, and they were all Filipino. I tell you, I felt so large in the Philippines. <laughs> I came up in my own esteem. I was like, wow, they're all like this big, you know. So it was it's pretty, pretty rough, the area we were ministering in, because if Ed and I would take a taxi, they would come out in a, it was a Christian hostel, they would come out and take the license plate in case we didn't come back. They'd have a way to try to track us. So that was the area where we were in, in the Philippines. And then while we were there, they got tickets to go up north. Now, up north, it was very well known for kidnapping Americans. Now, so they bought the tickets, so we were there because, all right. So th then we were ministering all around the Philippines, and God helped the Philippine Islands. It was really, really difficult ministry, really break your heart ministry. And um, 
in one of the churches we were in, I prophesied over a woman. Well, when you prophesy over people, I, I think we should all ask God to give to us the gift of prophecy. Because what Ed and I have found many times when you prophesy over people, it opens the doors. Um, sometimes we've been in places where the situation is a little, uh, what can I say, a lot of opposition. When you start prophesying, I remember this one particular place where the pastors who invited us weren't there. It was other pastors there, and they weren't on board for healing ministry. They were pretty uh, opposing us. What ended up was we ended up prophesying over everyone in the church, and they knew them. And after they came to us and they said, you prophesied over everyone accurately. We know these people. Would you pray over us? So the gift of prophecy can really turn everything around. So ask the Lord, you know, just to cultivate that gift. If you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit, you have that gift just to cultivate it. So um, that's what happened. We were in a church and I prophesied over this woman. And after that, she was like, I want you to come to my house. Can't you and Ed come to my house? I have a house on the beach and it's so beautiful and I would love to take you there. And I said, oh, thank you very much. Marie was her name, but our schedule is booked. Our schedule is full. You know, we, we won't have an opportunity for that. So we went on to the garbage dumps. It was a really tough ministry. And they're burning oil. And Ed inhaled a lot of that oil that they were burning. And that gave him a, a tremendous reaction. It was, really was a bad reaction. He was really suffering. And then in the hostel, they burn garbage like all around you, there, there's got smokes of garbage, so all that air is coming in your window. So he was really starting to have a really bad chest situation, whatever. So I said, we're going to go now on this plane up north. I, I didn't, it didn't seem like a good idea, so I prayed and we asked the Lord, and he led us to Zechariah, where he says, I've put a stone before you, and if you try to pass it, you'll shatter yourself on it. So I felt like the Lord saying, look, I'm setting up this obstacle. I don't want you going there. Don't go. So for the first time and the only time, actually, we canceled our tickets. And I thought, I've got to get them out of this hostel. I've got to get them away from this smoke. Now, praise God for the hostel also. We were in the right place there also because they had a prayer room on their roof. And Karen was on the mission team and Lori somewhere. You're an inside mission team. And they saw us praying on the roof of that hostel. Remember that, Ed? They said, we see you like up on a roof praying. And so that was the place we were staying in. So we were in the right place. But I knew we needed to move out of there for his health. So I called Marie. I'm coming. I'm coming right away. I'm going to take you. You're going to come up. You're going to stay in my house. You'll stay in my house for two nights. And she pulls up with this big wagon filled up with food and everything. And what they do have a lot in Philippines also is um, servants, a lot of servants. And she had her maid and she had her driver. And we went up to where Imelda Marcos had her home. So we go up to this beautiful place and we're sitting on the beach and ends up that she was very influential. She had a couple of hundred employees in factories there in the Philippine Islands and her husband was in America opening markets. So they were very influential and she was very kind. Anywhere you went, she's giving a sandwich to everybody. We stop at the checkpoints, sandwiches, you know, to people, just a very kind person. And we sat on the beach and talked to her all day and she said, you know, I've learned more from you today than I have in my entire life as a Christian. And she's a very influential person, so we knew that God had put us in the right place. And then the morning we were leaving, she said to us, I want you please, my maid has told me what the, uh, that her mother has a problem, and I want you to pray for her. Now I want to give you a little backstory. In the Philippine Islands, if you're not doing well in the hospital... They inject the IV and you're dead at whatever prescribed time. So we had known like this one man, you know, that um, Marie who had taken us, she said my brother-in-law who was a Buddhist and she said and the only comfort he had is if I would go and read the Bible and, and, I want, and he wanted to receive Christ but his wife said no, we have to build another Buddhist temple before we do that. And he got very sick and he was in the hospital and they decided the next day at four o'clock the, the family should come and say goodbye and at four o'clock he would die. So I knew, now she asked us to pray for the maid's mother and tells us the maid's mother's had a stroke. 
She's in the hospital. She's paralyzed on one side. She's not speaking. And she says, would you pray for her? And I thought, my gosh, this is a woman with low economic stature who's not now capable of working. What are they going to decide in the hospital that they should do with her? So I felt this is life and death. So Ed and I, we did, we prayed. She got on the phone with her, with her brother who was at the hospital and her brother said to her, you won't believe this, but mom has totally turned around. She's up now and she's walking and she's talking and she's seeing because of the power of the blood of Jesus. And I feel like Jesus brought us there for that woman. You know, for Marie, of course, very influential and she'd be just love the Lord. I know it was for her, but for that woman's life. So when there's a change in plans, my friends, don't get discouraged. When you don't have it all mapped out, say, praise the Lord. God is doing something. And you go and you feel like, I don't have the, the uh, uh, financial ability. I mean, I won't, you, know, you could just laugh about that with Bridge for Peace. I mean, if we waited for the financial ability to do what we've done, we would never have an orphanage and a school now and a healing center and everything that God has done traveling all over the world. If we waited for financial ability... Forget it. You know, I always say, you say yes, and then it comes. You say yes to what he wants, and then it comes. And we're the living proof of that. So whatever God is saying to you today, I, I pray that you'll say yes. And I want to just close with um, 2 Peter, I'm sorry, 1 Peter 2, 24. And I'm going to read this to you in um, the Wust version. Thank you, Jesus. This is the one who freely gave. Everything is because of him. Every blessing, every good promise, everything good in our lives comes from him. The one who judges righteously, who himself carried up to the cross our sins in his body and offered himself there as on an altar, doing this in order that we having died with respect to our sins, might live with respect to righteousness, by means of whose bleeding stripe, and this is what I want you to hear tonight, friends. This is a translation of the, the original text in the way this translator brings it, the way he explains the words, and I want you to hear what he says, because we're used to his stripes, but this is what it says, by means of whose bleeding stripe, and then in brackets he explains it. The word stripe is singular here. It's in the singular. A picture of our Lord's back after the scourging. One mass of raw, quivering flesh with no skin remaining trickling with blood, by whose stripe you were healed. Jesus. Jesus, you paid the price for everything, for us. Lord, you went through that because you loved us, and there was no other way for us to be reunited with you forever for eternity, but that you would become one stripe, one mass of bloody mess, scourged for us, crucified for us, for us, Lord. And Lord, we're afraid of so many things. We're afraid, Lord. We're afraid in our society. We're afraid tonight. So many things, we're afraid of our future, we're afraid for finance, we're afraid for, for relationships, we're afraid, Lord God. Oh, what you did for us, Lord God. We want to receive tonight the power of your blood again. Deliver us from fear. Jesus, by your stripe, we be delivered tonight from fear and from the need of having everything in order and everything organized and everything going according to my plan. That tonight, Lord, we relinquish that into your hands and trust you. You 
one mass of quivering, bloody, not even flesh on your back, Lord, for us. And we admit our fears tonight. But you say in your word that we should consider you. And that's what we want to do tonight, Lord. Look upon you. Look upon you, Lord God, and get delivered from the shackles that the enemy has held us in, Lord, that we have to have everything organized and planned out well into advance, into our retirement and beyond. We have to have all our accounts in order, all our retirement funds in order, all our mortgages in order, everything in order, that we can make sure that we can live comfortably for the rest of our lives. And that's our concern. Oh, Lord, let our concerns be your concerns, Lord God. Let what you love be what we love. Lord, let the thing that breaks your heart break our heart also tonight, Lord God. Let us throw off the shackles of securing our future when you have already secured it for us by your stripe we are healed. You have secured it for us, Lord God. You have secured it. You have secured it. You have secured it, Lord God. So Lord, change our minds tonight, Lord God. We're opening our minds and our hearts to you, Lord. Father, deliver us out of this culture in which we live. Deliver us out of this culture, Lord God, that we are citizens of heaven. Preach, you told us, Lord, preach that the kingdom of God has come near. Has come near to us. Come into us tonight in your kingdom and your glory. Come into us with your mindset, Lord God. Come into us, Lord, that we be delivered, Lord Jesus, from all these things that the devil has laid on us and which we have accepted as normal. Jesus. Thank you, Lord God, and praise you, Lord God, that you've called us to heal the sick, to raise the dead, to cleanse those who have leprosy, to drive out demons, because freely you have given, and freely we have received. Father, we thank you tonight that we are free. In you, we're free. And we reject and refuse all the bondages that the enemy would put on us all the fear of the future, we bind it up tonight in the name of Jesus. And we thank you, Lord God. We thank you, Lord, that we're relying on you. We're trusting in you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that it's about heavenly organization, about you ordering our steps, Lord God. About you ordering our steps. Wherever your footprint is, we put our foot in your footprint and go forward, Lord. So we thank you that we're a people that you love. Lord, if... <laughs> You demonstrated to us your great love. You demonstrated it to us. Lord, you demonstrated it. Let us think about your love. Let us think about the price you paid. And we celebrate that you're in glory now, Lord. And we're coming, Jesus. We're coming. And on our road between here and your throne, where we will worship you forever, because of what you've done for us, Lord. We are going to live. We are going to live, Lord, relying on you. You're going to do wondrous things through everyone in this room, Lord God. We're going to cast off the shackles tonight in your name, Lord, for we are so much more than what we have thought of ourselves, Lord God. And we thank you tonight, Jesus, that we can rely on you. We do rely on you tonight. Wherever we are tonight, we thank you and we praise you that you are in charge of our lives. And tonight, as we pray, as the team comes and prays, Lord, the glory is yours. The honor is yours. The price is the price that you paid. You paid it to be our bridge for peace. And I thank you tonight, Lord, that everyone will receive everything that you paid the price for tonight, Lord. I thank you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I praise your name. Oh, Father, bless this house. Bless this beautiful house, Lord God. Bless this bit of heaven on earth, Lord God. Bless this place. Continuously, Lord, saturate the walls, Lord. 
continuously, Lord, even as Samantha stands by the door, I know she's praying, she's praying, she's praying. Lord, we pray you bring many more in that need to come in, Lord. You say there's many more you need to gather in. Gather them in through us, Lord God. And Lord, leave an anointing here, Lord, for the weeks when Samantha's closed, Father. We ask that your anointing would increase, Lord, that this is a house where you abide. And Father, in each one of us tonight, Lord, I thank you that we're going to receive because you say freely receive. We're going to receive not based on anything we did or anything, anything that, that I, I want to come against every spirit of unworthiness in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, we're, we're coming tonight, Lord, because you love us, you called us, and you paid the price. And we're coming to freely receive what you freely gave, Lord. So I thank you, Father. I pray tonight, Lord, that those listening, all those that are here tonight, would be encouraged by the testimonies, encouraged. You're faithful, Lord. You're faithful. We can rely on you, Lord. And I thank you, Jesus. I thank you and I praise you for each one coming for whatever need there is. I thank you that it's been already given at the cross. That you've met the need. And tonight, Holy Spirit, we thank you as you bring it from 2,000 years ago into the present moment. Father, seal your love in our hearts. Seal your courage in our minds. Make us hard-headed, as you say in Ezekiel, Lord, that we would have a diamond forehead like a point. You say in your word, you will make our forehead hard against their foreheads. Lord God, let that be the story of our life, that we never cave into the opposition, but that through the power of your blood, Lord, we go forward. No matter what lies are spoken, we reject them and we go forward in you that we could attain the great destiny and the great purpose for which you created it, us, that you would receive all the glory. We love you, Jesus.